midnight Eastern time. Uh, my name is Dr. Al Rondio, and I am the one that coordinates our grant for the International Nurses Society on Addictions. Um, we have um, are in collaboration with the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry, uh, which is funded through a SAMHSA grant, and there are several organizations that are part of this grant to provide um, a provider's clinical support system for dealing with the opioid epidemic. So uh, what we do in this grant period are around four webinars every year. This is the uh, last webinar for this grant period. And then um, the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry was refunded for another three-year time period. So we will, which that grant will kick off in August sometime. And over the next year, we will continue to do our webinars. So today, it really gives me um, great pleasure to introduce a um, couple of colleagues of mine that I work with at Drexel University. Um, I'm going to read their bio, and then I will also talk um, a little bit about evaluation and contact hours and a couple slides, and then they will take over. So the two presenters that are presenting today are Dr. Joanne Schwartz and Dr. Kimberly Garcia. Both are uh, faculty at Drexel University. Dr. Schwartz is a full-time faculty member who teaches in the Psychiatric Nurse Practitioner Program at Drexel. She is certified by ANCC as a Psychiatric Mental Health Nurse Practitioner. Um, she's also ANCB certified, that's the um, nursing certification for the International Nurses Society on Addictions as a um, advanced practice nurse in addictions. And she's also certified as the National League for Nursing uh, Certified Nurse Educator. She has maintained clinical practices in adult health and addictions and eating disorder recovery. Uh, she previously has held a chair position at Drexel. She, for several years, uh, was the chair of the Accelerated Career Entry BSN program at Drexel. Currently, she's president of the Foundation of Addictions Nursing, which is uh, an arm of the International Nurses Society on Addictions. She's also a fellow in the International Academy of Addictions Nursing, and she's a board member of the International Nurses Society on Addictions. Her research interests include accelerated nursing education and addiction nursing. She earned her PhD in nursing education from Villanova University in Philadelphia, her MSN and BSN from the University of Pennsylvania, and her postmaster certificate from North Kentucky, Kentucky University. And she currently is also matriculating in our addictions counseling master's program at Drexel. Dr. Kimberly Garcia is an assistant clinical professor of nursing and serves as the director of psychiatric mental health nursing of the nurse practitioner program at Drexel. Dr. Garcia received her BSN, her MSN in nursing education, and a postmaster certificate in family and gerontological nurse practitioner studies, and a postmaster certificate in transcultural and international nursing from Duquesne University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. She also completed her postmaster certificate in the Family Psychiatric Mental Health Nurse Practitioner Program at the University of Pennsylvania, and she received her Doctorate of Nursing Practice with subspecializations in psychiatry, addiction medicine, and palliative medicine at Columbia University in New York City. While at Columbia, she completed clinical residencies at New York Psychiatric Institute, New York Presbyterian Hospital, Columbia University Medical Center, and Geisinger Hospital in Danville, Pennsylvania. She is board certified as a family, gerontological, and psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner across the lifespan from ANCC. She's also certified as a nurse educator and an addictions registered nurse advanced practice. She maintains an active clinical practice in addiction medicine and outpatient community mental health. So I really welcome both of them. They are two of my best colleagues. They're, they're just awesome faculty, and I'm thrilled to have them present today. Now, we will go through the webinar. They will present for about 40 to 45 minutes, and then we will answer questions. There is a question box if you post your questions there. At the end of their presentation, I will read the questions, and they will answer them. Also, you will be sent an online evaluation survey following the webinar. Um, this webinar is uh, going to award you a contact hour, which comes from 
the American Association of Nurse Attorneys um, through the California Board of Registered Nursing. So that will be awarded and sent to you by email. And then one of the requirements of the grant is that we also 30 days after the webinar mail you the evaluation survey again. So please pay attention to that. John, if you could advance the slide. Um, the authors have, uh, the provide, and the presenters have um, provided that there's no funding for the development or writing of this presentation, and they also have revealed no conflicts of interest relevant to the content of this presentation. And the next slide. And the overarching goal of the Provider Clinical Support System grant is to train a diverse range of healthcare professionals in the safe and effective prescribing of opioid medications for the treatment of pain, as well as the treatment of substance use disorders, particularly opioid use disorders with medication-assisted treatments. Then the next slide. And so I will turn it over to them. They will review the objectives and then they will proceed with the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Rondia. Dr. Garcia? Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Garcia. I just wanted to review the educational objectives. At the conclusion of this activity, participants should be able to describe the cluster B personality disorders, consider the risk factors associated with disease expression and progression, identify the correlation between personality and substance use disorders, formulate treatment recommendations that are guided by the state of the science, and recognize the unique challenges associated with treating individuals with substance use and cluster B personality disorders. And now I'll turn it over to Dr. Schwartz. Thank you, Dr. Gar Garcia. Uh, first, I just wanna thank everyone for joining us today. I realize uh, your days are very busy and I appreciate uh, your willingness to attend uh, the presentation and hopefully I'm confident it will be um, informative for you as well as hopefully enjoyable. So thank you. Okay, I know that I have a wide breadth of backgrounds, clinical specialties uh, attending today. So I thought I'd do a slide on what exactly is the DSM. So it's a Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. It is a clinical tool used for diagnosing and categorizing psychiatric disorders, and it was developed by the American Psychiatric Association. The first version was published in 1952 as a variant of the International Classification of Diseases. Each disorder has established criteria necessary for diagnosis, and it is comprehensive. It is all mental health disorders. The current version, DSM-5, was published in 2013. It was developed over 10 years by mental health experts in a variety of different fields in the, uh, in the specialty of mental health. And I always refer to it to my students as a cookbook and it's necessary for your clinical work and they need to bring it with them when they go to clinical. It is almost, um, it's got, it's fairly prescriptive. So you have your, your disorder, your, your disorder with possible diagnosis and the criteria that needs to be met in order to establish that diagnosis. What is a personality disorder? A personality disorder is an enduring and inflexible pattern of long duration leading to significant distress or impairment and is not due to the use of substances or another medical condition. It causes distress and disability in most of life's domains on a daily basis. So it's pervasive. Thoughts and behaviors deviate significantly from cultural norms. So I remember having this experience uh, where I was working with someone um, from a different cultural background than mine. And um, I was at my home, she was joining me at my home and we were working on a project. And my father was there and um, he was sort of sitting in the living room, sort of in our way a little bit, and she didn't say anything to him. And I was thinking, why doesn't she just tell him to move over? And so I went over and I said, Dad, you need to move over. We need this space here. And I remember thinking that she was a little bit uncomfortable, perhaps a little aghast that I had directed my father to another area of the room so that we could get our work done. And in looking back and reflecting on the situation, I realized that in her culture of origin, um, it, was, it was not appropriate to direct what she saw as the head of the household to another area. And so in a situation like that, when you're diagnosing and using the DSM-5, 
in like trying and establishing whether you had a personality disorder, you need to make sure that it's not a culturally appropriate behavior. The behaviors of someone with a personality disorder deviate. It affects multiple life domains. It's not just one area. It's not that you have struggled with your boss and you're having problems at work, but you're doing very well in other areas of your life. You're developing and growing and are happy in other areas. It's pervasive. Symptoms emerge gradually and pretty much by adolescence. Many times the symptoms are present at early adolescence and definitely by late adolescence. And as the old saying is that uh, personality is established by five years of age. So these problematic interactions occur by adolescence. Okay. So I thought it'd be helpful because we're all coming from different background and clinical backgrounds to review personality disorders a little bit. Okay, there are 10 personality disorders as per the DSM-5. And they're categorized into three clusters. Cluster A is weird, cluster B is wild, and cluster C is worried. Now that is sort of, I think, a little bit of a glib way to look at them, but it's a way that um, for many years um, that we have educated our students to appreciate and to anticipate what you might expect when you are dealing with these different clusters of personality disorders. One tip I always share with my student is for remembering. I have a terrible memory and I hate to memorize. So I so this is helpful to me. Weird, wild, and worried are alphabetical and that corresponds with clusters A, B, and C. So I always tell them that little tidbit for their certification exams as well as my exams. So let's review cluster A personality disorders. Cluster A are the weird. They're characterized by social ineptness and isolation. There are three of them. The first one is paranoid personality disorder. It's characterized by mistrust and suspicion. Potentially people are out to get you and you need to be very careful. You need to watch your back. There is thought that Richard Nixon had paranoid personality disorder. Now, I don't know, I never met the man. Um, so this is just what they, it, it, experts in reviewing uh, behaviors in the past and throughout his life thought that it might potentially be, or at least his behaviors were consistent with the paranoid personality disorder. Schizoid personality disorder is characterized by desire for self-isolation and they tend to be very aloof. Albert Einstein, Kramer from Seinfeld, for those of you who watch Seinfeld. And it, what's interesting about this personality disorder is this, that they desire self-isolation. They want to be by themselves. They enjoy their company, their own company. Schizotypal personality disorder is characterized by unusual, odd thoughts and beliefs, magical thinking. The classic one is Willy Wonka in Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. I think that's a... a, a, a a movie that many people are familiar with. Um, and it's just the magical thinking is odd. They're typically not scary or frightening, they're just odd. Now, normally schizotypal personality disorders want interaction, but they can't get it because their thinking is so odd, which is different from schizoid, which is they desire self-isolation. Okay, the cluster B, which we're gonna focus on today, are the wild ones, characterized by drama, erratic behaviors and flamboyance. They're quite exciting. Antisocial personality disorder, characterized by disregard for the rights and feelings of others and society's expectations for what is right and wrong. Two that uh, are commonly known to um, most of societies is, are Adolf Hitler and Saddam Hussein. So there was a complete disregard for the rights of others and ability to feel compassion and empathy characterize this personality disorder. There is thought that 50 to, it depends on your, your source that you use, uh, 50 to 75% of prison populations can have antisocial personality disorder. Borderline personality disorder, it's characterized by emotional behavior instability. Chaos is the word here, chaotic relationships and a lot of anxiety. There is thought that Diana, Princess of Wales, had borderline personality. As, and a piece of borderline personality is very, a fear of being abandoned and her mother had left her very early on. And they thought that that might be um, set the stage for her development of borderline personality disorder. I also use the other example of a classic teenage drama queen. Now, most teenagers, mercifully, they develop and grow out of the stage. But during those terrible teens, 
Um, think of uh, the teenage daughter that is in all sorts of um, different friendships and having fights and new friendships every week and uh, dating a new fellow every week and um, having chaos and difficulties and very temperamental and, and difficult to, just general difficult to deal with. And fortunately, most um, people that are, have teenage drama problems are usually um, mature out of that. But this would be for someone that continues in that manner. Okay, histrionic personality disorder still with the cluster Bs characterized by attention seeking, self-centeredness and flirtatious behavior. The ones I could have thought about, and I try to use uh, movies that everyone knows, or, or books and movies, Blanche Dubois in Streetcar Named Desire. If you remember her, read that book in high school, um, how flirtatious she was and her manner of dress and, and the way she, she relied heavily on her physical attractiveness and her sexuality to interact with people. And I think Scarlett O'Hara in Gone with the Wind. Narcissistic personality disorders characterized by self-importance and arrogance. It's all about me and how you can reflect on my, how you, I can use you to reflect on my greater glory. Joan Crawford is typically identified as someone that had personality, uh, narcissistic personality disorder. And I think as she was portrayed in Mommy Dearest, you could certainly make that argument. Okay, the cluster sees the worried ones characterized by anxiety. Avoidant personality disorder, characterized by feelings of inadequacy and inferiority, as well as extreme shyness that precludes a desired relationship. They want to be in a relationship, but they're too shy to be. Some self-acknowledged ones, and I thought this was impressive in Hollywood that, that they would acknowledge that they avoid in personality disorder. Donny Osmond and Kim Bassinger, and they, they have acknowledged how it impacted on their careers. Kim Bassinger literally almost dropped off the face of the earth for quite some time in her career. I never heard about her. And she was really undergoing a lot of anxiety related to avoiding personality disorder. Dependent personality disorder, it's characterized by excessive reliance on others for emotional and physical needs. Uh, patients with uh, dependent personality disorder tend to be quite needy, clingy, and helpless. They can be taken advantage by others. In particular, you will see this antisocial um, a dependent personality dynamic dyad uh, develop. Uh, and I think of, you hear this on the news a lot of times, is a female sending fan mail to male prisoners convicted of murder. And also I, I think a recent case where there was a female prison guard who aided prisoners to escape. And it sounded like she it felt that she had feelings toward the one, uh, one of the prisoners, one of the escapees. So I thought in hearing that, that that was somewhat consistent with dependent personality disorder. Obsessive compulsive personality disorder is characterized by perfectionism, orderly, orderliness, and rigidity. Uh, Adrian Monk from Monk, that, uh, I think you could argue, had OC, um, obsessive compulsive personality disorder. Uh, I could not watch that show after a while because it would be so annoying, his inability to progress and get things done because he got so tied up with doing things just perfect. And also the classic anal individual in terms of the Freudian theory. Uh, this person is, is cannot be fluid or flexible. They have a great deal of difficulty with that. Okay, so what does the literature say about substance use and the personality disorders? I pulled out some studies I thought were of interest. Um, in one study of the cluster B personality disorders, antisocial and borderline personality disorders were significantly associated with persistent alcohol, cannabis, and nicotine use disorders. Of note, in this study, narcissistic personality disorder was not associated with substance use disorders. In another study examining early adolescence, borderline personality disorder, as well as conduct order, which is essentially the predecessor of antisocial personality disorder. Below 18 years of age, you, or conduct disorder, once you hit 18 are still demonstrating those behaviors, then it's antisocial personality disorder. They were associated with substance use disorder symptoms, as well as an elevated risk for future onset of substance use disorder symptoms. Analyses over 30 years suggest that cluster B personality disorder, specifically borderline histrionic and narcissistic in the study, are independent risks for development of SUD and warrant clinical attention. Another study 
um, in respondents with an alcohol use disorder, the highest prevalence of PDs was antisocial at 12.3% of the respondents. Obsessive compulsive personality disorder was 12.1%, and paranoid personality disorder was 10.2%. Okay. And in our good old DSM-5, highest prevalence of antisocial personality disorder, greater than 70% existed among samples of males with alcohol use disorders and from substance abuse clinics, prisons, and other forensic settings. So it's pretty compelling information data. So what does this mean for the clinician? So in general, personality disorders have greater risk of substance use disorder. This makes sense if you think about it. There's social isolation for the cluster A's, chaotic lives for the cluster B's, and anxiety and fear to deal with in the cluster C's. So in general, the use of substance use disorders is greater in personality disorders. And there's a reason in terms of their interaction with society, their interpersonal relationships, how they're experiencing life, their cognition and behaviors, can be ameliorated by substance use. So my students always ask me this because they get out into the clinical arena and they come back and they see the diagnoses. Now, personality disorders are, the various personality disorders, there's not a great deal of disparity between the, the prevalence of them. Generally they run, I would say in the lower ends, about point a half a percent up to 6% or so. That would be where the, the large majority of them fall. Now, different sources will say different things, but it's not, we're not talking 15% of the population. But my students see the borderline antisocial personality disorders a lot in the clinical arena. So why they wanna know, where are the paranoid personality disorders? Well, if you think about it, borderline personality disorder, antisocial personality disorder may be more commonly seen in treatment due to their ongoing pervasive and severe family and interpersonal conflict legal issues employment problems, self-harm, and suicidal behaviors that are exacerbated by increased comorbidity of substance use disorders. So not only do they have um, severely uh, impaired interpersonal skills, but they're, it's, they are exacerbated by an increased risk for substance abuse. And the and frequent interpersonal interactions lead to significant interpersonal conflict. If I'm isolated, as some of the, uh, some of the other personality disorders are, they're not going to have an opportunity to get into conflict with the neighbor and have a fight and the police get called and then I'm arrested. That doesn't happen because they're not interacting with them. So, so anti, now that we're going to focus on antisocial and borderline personality disorders uh, because of their presence in the clinical arena as well as their increased risk for comorbidity with substance use disorders, I thought I'd go into the uh, diagnostic criteria. Once again, our good old DSM-5. Um, this is criteria as listed in the DSM-5. Antisocial personality disorder, chronic irresponsibility and unreliability, persistent lying and stealing deceitfulness, use of alias, use of aliases, conning others for personal profit or pleasure, lack of remorse for hurting others. They really lack compassion. They, they lack empathy. They cannot take on how another person might feel. Reckless disregard for safety of self or others. So a lot of times they may, may be engaging in drunk driving and they do not typically show anxiety, depression or irrational thinking. Many a times when they get into substance use, it is, uh, it's been my clinical experience that they're almost baffled by it, that they had a, that they developed a problem with drug use. In many of my experiences, uh, they share with me that they thought they could manage it and they wouldn't have a problem and they could keep it under control. It comes off as almost uh, very uh, overly confident and cocky, and they're baffled that they're struggling with it. But they typically do not show anxiety, depression, or irrational thinking. These folks are cool as cucumbers. Some risk factors, uh, genetics in all these disorders that we will discuss today, genetics plays a powerful role in uh, the development of the disorders. Um, and def, uh, uh, very much so in the first degree relatives. So parent to child, sibling to sibling. Presence of family history of alcoholism, paternal criminality, conflict, divorce, and poverty. Parenting is characterized by physical punishment, rejection, poor communication, and lack of, lack of supervision. 
abandonment and physical and sexual abuse, particularly physical and sexual abuse that occurs in the first five years of life seem to be highly correlated with the development of antisocial personality disorders. Okay. Borderline personality disorder, difficulty controlling emotions. I had a professor that said to me one time, Joanne, think the faucet is all on or all off. It's not modulated. The response is never middle of the road. It's very, almost always very extreme. Relationships involving intense anger and possibly physical fights. Relationship instability is profound. They have great deal of difficulty in academic en endeavors. They start uh, academic programs, but do not take them to completion. There is a uh, difficulty conflict with the faculty member or other uh, students in, in class. Um, uh, the job problems, getting not getting along with coworker, the coworkers. So this can be really significant. In fact, when I do my psychiatric history, I, I always ask about the current job, how long the person's been in the job, and what is their greatest tenure in any job. The other day, I had a woman I suspected had per, uh, borderline personality disorder. So I asked her in the course of the psychiatric evaluation, how long have you been, uh, how long have you been in your current job? And she said nine months. So I thought, well, maybe it's a new, just new job. And so I said, what is, tell me the job that you have been at the longest. And she said to me, and this is a middle-aged woman, my current job. So that was the longest tenure she had at a job was nine months and she had worked pretty much throughout her life a lot of different jobs, but this was the longest time she was at a job. So right there, my suspicion index was greatly increased that she had borderline personality disorder. Uh, they have an identity disturbance with a persistently unstable self-image. Um, one of my friends has a door that has borderline personality disorder, and she shared with me, she said, Joanne, every relationship she gets into is she takes on the style, the, the style dress, the mannerisms, and the musical taste of her significant other. And then once that relationship is over, which it very often is and quite, and it comes to a, a very dramatic end and, and not necessarily really a long-term relationship, the next person she dates, she does the exact same things. She said, I can't tell you all the stuff we have thrown out because now she has a, a new significant other and their tastes are different than her previous significant other. So there's a sense that, you know, like my musical tastes pretty much are the same. It doesn't change with who I'm interacting with. Um, that's my sense of my, who I am. But that, and for somebody with borderline personality disorder, can be very, very unstable. There are frantic efforts to avoid real or perceived abandonment. So they're very sensitive to rejection. So for instance, if a therapist is going on vacation in the summer, they often get very agitated and very upset. They perceive that the therapist is abandoning them. This can echo from their childhoods when maybe a parent had abandoned them either through divorce or death. Frequent demonic changes in mood, opinions, and plans. So thing, things are always changing. Chronic feelings of emptiness are always searching. And it's my belief that that is the characteristic that very heavily pulls them into drug use. It's uh, drugs we know have a uh, tremendous ability to cause euphoria. And many, nearly every activity in life cannot cause it to that intensity, to that degree. So they're struggling with chronic feelings of emptiness and drugs will take that away. So there's a very seductive appeal to it. They're impulsive. They will quit a job without another source of income because they've had a conflict at work. They may move in with someone they just met and this person is maybe identified as the love of their life and a few weeks later, it's over. Uh, a characteristic that is very commonly, very heavily correlated with borderline personality disorder is suicide attempts and self-mutilation. Self-mutilation may serve as self-punishment or catharsis or distraction related to the chaos. I think the status, I, I've, read some, I've read so many different things on this feature, this characteristic, but I think it's like 69% of patients that self-harm have borderline personality disorder. So it's a very commonly used maladaptive coping skill. Okay, some risk factors, genetics once again. Unstable early environments characterized by abuse and neglect, 
and parental psychopathology. Substance use disorders are common in parents and mood disorders as well. So you'll see that very frequently in both antisocial personality disorder as well as borderline personality disorder that the uh, childhood is characterized by instability and not necessarily a nurturing stable environment. Okay. Premature death in antisocial and borderline personality disorders. Approximately eight to 10% of individuals with borderline personality disorder will commit suicide. That's profound. Individuals with antisocial personality disorder are at an increased risk of early death due to accidents, suicide, or homicide. Substance use disorders, now remember, there are increased risk in individuals with antisocial and borderline personality disorders, raises the risk of suicide as well. And suicide, I think it's important to note this, that suicide often serves different purposes for these personality disorders. Borderline personality disorder is suicide serves an escape from the pain of the chaos. Antisocial personality disorder is a, so, more the escape from punishment or life isn't playing out in the way that they desire. And I wonder if Aaron Hernandez is an example of this that he was in prison for murdering someone for homicide and that he didn't want to be trapped in prison anymore. So he committed suicide to escape. Okay, so management of borderline and antisocial personality disorders. Okay, so some therapeutic management of them, like uh, thoughts. Focus is on helping the patient learn new ways of coping. Now, as we know, personalities are often considered very entrenched. And uh, of those, antisocial personality disorder is probably considered the most entrenched. So, uh, you know, be mindful that you're probably not going to get a complete 180 in these individuals in terms of their behaviors. But you certainly can maximize uh, change for them so that they, if they desire to have a decreased level of uh, chaos that they uh, can utilize some skills to arrive there. Strategies for effective management, be aware of your reactions to the patient's behavior. I had a clinician one time said to me, Joanne, I found myself responding a little bit too reactive to a patient. And that's not typical for me. And he said, there's two things here. You're probably either dealing with something about yourself that you don't like and you see it in the patient or you're dealing with a personality disorder. I think I was dealing with a personality disorder, <laughs> but maybe that's just self-preservation of my self-esteem. Uh, you wanna use patience, consistency, and flexibility. I call this my loving but firm parent mood. That I'm not punitive, but I, and I'm patient, but I'm consistent and I can be reasonably flexible as the situation permits but you're not gonna take advantage of me and you're not going to um, use me to, to manipulate the other patients. I model appropriate problem solving interpersonal and social skills. So I let them see how I interact with other patients on the unit or uh, colleagues so that they get an idea of how appropriate interpersonal skills are. So, because remember now, they probably haven't gotten much of that as a child when they were learning and very impressionable. Set clear limits and follow through with consequences. I find that newer clinicians may need a lot of support with this. Um, the borderline personality disorder patients um, can sometimes be too much of a, a handful and the chaos is a little, it can be a, a lot. Um, they can cause a lot of chaos to occur on the unit. I don't typically find that with the antisocial personality disorders, but they can be very manipulative in a cool way. So for instance, I remember having, I was a, new, a younger clinician and I had a patient that I believe had antisocial personality disorder. And he was, I realized he was leaving, leaving the unit with a group of other patients and they were hiding him. And when he came back, I made eye contact with him. It was extremely cocky. And I had, to sit, I had to manage that. And that was not easy to do as a, new, as a young clinician. And I needed a more seasoned uh, staff member to help me. So be mindful of that if you have peers that are earlier in their careers, they, they might need help with this. Okay, some treatment considerations. Due to limited insight, the patient with the cluster B personality disorder believes, I'm not the problem, you are. They often do not see the value of staying in treatment because of this. 
and I had a very interesting experience. I was uh, participating in a, a group therapy session and a patient that had severe per, uh, borderline personality disorder, I mean, her life was extremely chaotic. Um, it was just really falling apart. And she sat in group and her feedback to another patient was that uh, you don't get along with anybody. That's why no one likes you. And I thought, isn't this interesting that this is pretty much the summary of her life, yet she's not seeing it, but she sees it in someone else. So very often they won't stay, especially if you start, uh, start to turn the heat up a little bit on their behaviors and expect some, uh, some accountability, they'll, they very often leave. The other thing I think is important is patients with antisocial personality disorder may be in treatment only for external reasons, legal employment or spousal pressures. And I have seen that a lot in addictions recovery. Patients will sit down and tell me right away, they don't believe that they have a problem. It's everybody else's problem. Now this might be two and three dr drunk driving arrest, um, that they're only there to save their job and their, uh, their spouse is sitting on them and they gotta get them off their back. Or the other situation is the judge, my lawyer, my attorney advised me to be here. He said it looked good for the court system because they have pending charges. Okay, so just be mindful of that. Okay, some psychotherapeutic treatment modalities and antisocial and borderline personalities. Individual group forums. Um, individual can be very helpful if the patient cannot tolerate being in a group. If their interpersonal skills are so problematic that it's going to cause antagonism with other members of the group, it's probably better to do individual. The other thing that's nice about individual is that there's this one-to-one -one relationship with the therapist. So they can have the time for themselves to really focus on their issues. Uh, group forums don't provide that, but group forums also have that very nice benefit of that you get feedback from your peers, which I think can be very helpful in uh, adjusting your behaviors and learning from people. Individual tends to be more expensive. Group forums are less expensive because group therapy is less expensive because there are other patients getting therapy. Um, Okay, uh, so you have to be mindful. Um, I also find the antisocial personality disorders can sometimes, if you don't have a strong leader or therapist running the group, they can hijack the group. They can be very charming. Um, the women can get seduced by their behaviors and the men admire their behaviors and think they really can establish a leadership role in the group. So that has to, that's something that has to be, uh, be aware of the leader for the group therapist. I'm um, trying to think of anything else that are typically a problem. And borderline personality disorders may um, you know, just antagonize other members of the group uh, and have little insight in doing that. Some therapies that are commonly used uh, and help also with addictions as well as the personality disorder, so it's a nice combo. Supportive therapy um, is based on numerous therapeutic schools of thought it's a combination. I love supportive therapy. It can be done by any number of professionals. Um, it provides support and encouragement as patients find their way. The focus was on the patient developing self-esteem and self-reliance. Uh, it can be done by any number of professionals, so it's very helpful. So if you have a patient that uh, with a personality disorder that may not be, is, having, is struggling finding housing, or very often they're living with their family, the family's done, they can't handle it anymore, and the patient has to go, you may be able to get supports, uh, legal support to help the patient, and that attorneys, housing attorneys can um, provide them, can provide supportive therapy. I think of it as the favorite aunt. You're loving, you're caring, you're nurturing, you want to see this, per, this patient do well and find their own way and gain independence and self-reliance. Uh, psychodynamic, think Freud, unresolved childhood conflict results in anxiety, conflict is addressed. Um, this can be used, it's fallen out of favor, but it still is used, so I wanted to include it. Um, it is, it have, to have a sense of it being very reflective, um, and it tends to be quite long term, which may be a problem for insurance companies. Cognitive behavioral, this is a workhorse therapy. Negative automatic thoughts are challenged, and uh, I do this on myself all the time. So frequently I'll end up in a traffic jam and I get really annoyed with myself, like I should have known better or something, or like I was able to control the traffic. 
And so I, I will speak negatively to myself. Oh, how could you be so stupid? You shouldn't have taken this road. Well, how would I have known that? So now I am, I am supplanting that automatic thought with something else such as, gee, a lot of people are in this bad traffic jam. Okay, much more neutral. So that's what cognitive behavioral therapy does. It challenges these negative automatic thoughts someone has. Cognitive behavioral therapy has a lot of um, evidence that it's, it's very effective and it's quick, like it, just a few months. Sometimes patients just have like maybe five to 10 sessions and they've got the skill they need and they move on. Dialectical behavioral therapy, this has gotten really popular in the past, I would say five years. It's, it was developed with the idea that would uh, work, it would be particularly supportive and effective with borderline personality disorders. It identifies triggers and more adapted coping skills to use during stressful times so that you are not alienating others, so that you're supplanting those um, negative, uh, those maladaptive coping skills with more adaptive ones. And it's always helpful given the impulsivity of a borderline personality disorder, uh, uh, their trigger. So they know, uh oh, this is a trigger for me. I need to step away from this before I say something to my boss and I lose my job. Okay, some pharmacotherapy. Uh, and we're talking in real in global terms here, um, given the time restraints. Selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. They're the cornerstone of treatment for depression and anxiety. Just remember, they take a little time to work, a few weeks. They don't work right, uh, right away, which can be sometimes a clinical issue for the patient if they're struggling with say, anxiety. Now, Trexo may be used to decrease self-harming behaviors, as well as for opioid or alcohol addictions. And lithium, divalproic sodium, also known as Depakote, and carbamazepine, also known as Tecretol, may be used for irritability, impulsivity, and mood swings. Uh, atypical antipsychotics may be used for transient psychotic symptoms and impulsive symptoms such as anger, hostility, and recklessness. We use these, they're becoming an enormous part of our uh, treatment with our patients, um, uh, particularly with uh, borderline personality disorders um, for the impulsivity as well as antisocial personality disorders with the anger and aggression, things like that. Okay. And um, just some words about controlled substances in the, with antisocial and borderline personality disorders, the cluster Bs. Uh, cautious use of controlled substances in these personality disorders due to the increased rates of substance use disorders. Now keep in mind, antisocial personality disorder, you're thinking of that meant in manipulation. They're cool little cucumbers. They're going to charm you and get they want, and you may not even be aware of it. Manipulation to obtain drugs. They may be using or dealing. Now, using is usually a situation I already mentioned, like I, I, I can't believe I couldn't keep this under control, um, or dealing. Now, I share this story with uh, my students. Um, my colleague had a patient come in that was on uh, opioids for chronic pain. And she was sharing with me that they have a very, um, they're very serious about separating the patient from the practice if there's any problems. And they did a drug screen, and lo and behold, there was absolutely no opioids in the drug screen. So I shared a story with my students, and my one student said to me, oh, Dr. Schwartz, you must have been a little bit shocked because here you have an antisocial personality disorder that is not abusing drugs. And then I realized what she didn't make the connection, and I said, well, pray tell, what was he doing with those drugs? And she paused and she saw the light, the epiphany, the, the neuronal connection occurred. And she said, ah, he's selling it to other people. And I said, yes. I said, and he was promptly separated from the practice. That day, he, the letter got issued. Okay. Borderline personality disorder, anxiety is often significant. That is a key character feature of that personality disorder. Um, so you need to consider that um, if the SSRIs are not working right away, um, take a couple weeks to work, how are we going to manage their anxiety? And that's where it brings us to the next slide. Uh, treatment approaches, uh, treatment contracts with clear consequences, which I think we discussed already, increased therapeutic contact for support. Um, so for patients with borderline personality disorder, that the therapy is a cornerstone of treatment. Medications don't really help. They help to modulate the symptoms, but they're certainly not going to significantly play a huge part in the management of the content can be very helpful for them. Regular may need to increase it during stressful times. 
And then also the non hemiforming medication for anxiety that may need to be used for patients with borderline personality disorder, not typically an issue for antisocial patients because they're not prone to anxiety, they're too cocky. Um, and some of those medications that we commonly use are Buspar, Adorex, Neurontin, and Indural. Okay, and Dr. Garcia? Are you able to hear me okay? Yes, we are, we're perfectly. Okay, all right. So we're going to um, end this portion of the presentation with a case study. And this is a patient that I actually encountered in my, in my clinical practice. Obviously, some of the details have been revised um, to, of course, you know, not give away um, any um, personal information. However, uh, in this case, we have a 32-year-old male with a history of unstable interpersonal relationships. He was a very impulsive individual, mood was very reactive, and had a long history of engaging in self-injurious behaviors, um, and the rest. So his symptoms um, at times, of course, we know that with many of these um, personality disorders, symptoms tend to wax and wane. And his symptoms at that time had become quite intense. And of course, he was starting to develop um, interpersonal conflict, not only at home, but also at work. Um, he was arguing with his girlfriend, and she would um, often kick him out. Um, and within a few days, he would start calling her, and he would be begging her to reunite with him. Um, and he would, at times, threaten to harm himself if she didn't agree um, to the reunification. When he was not in good standing with his girlfriend, he started sleeping in the office. Um, and was drinking um, more alcohol than he should have um, and was starting to smell like alcohol even during the work day. Um, and as part of his reunification agreement with his girlfriend, he agreed to seek treatment. That was one of the criterion that she established if they were to get back together, that he needed to address his mood symptoms. Um, and so he reported traumatic anxiety um, and stated that it was his anxiety that really fueled his anger and irritability. He was going days without sleeping appropriately. And so he was started on Xanax and Ambien. Um, they were initially quite effective, but as with many patients who start taking controlled substances, we know that the efficacy wanes over time and they start requiring escalating doses. So eventually, he ends up near the therapeutic ceiling for both medications. Um, when he was stressed or upset, he couldn't get sufficient relief from the medications and is forced to self-medicate. Um, I think the emphasis we should really look at is, you know, this real displacement of, I don't know how many times patients have said to me, um, because you are not properly treating me, I am forced to either use drugs or to consume alcohol. And if you would give me what I needed, um, then I would not need to do that. And inevitably, it's never Prozac or Paxil that <laughs> someone's looking for. I can almost guarantee it's going to be a controlled substance. Um, so when he was not getting sufficient relief, of course, he was forced to self-medicate um, either with alcohol or by taking um, additional medication. However, when things were going better in his relationship, this would happen less frequently. So he would say his quality of life is much better, the relationship is going well, starts to develop some new interests, he's getting some hobbies and extracurriculars, going to animal rights advocacy dem demonstrations, enjoyed dining out, and was learning to safely handle a gun by going to the local shooting range. Um, his father had recently died and left him his uh, prized gun collection in his will and the patient sought psychiatric clearance to carry the, a weapon. He makes improvements in his occupational functioning and per his reports, the psychiatrist was very pleased with his progress. Now, unfortunately, uh, what happened, uh, we'll, we'll go through some of these questions first. So when considering his file behavioral symptoms and history, um, what are your concerns? So when we start thinking, and kind of exploring for, um, uh, for underlying personality disorders, I saw that one of the questions said, you know, well, how do we know? Is it addiction that becomes the 
you know, is that first or is it a personality disorder? And this is really where you need to have an excellent history. You really need to understand kind of the temporality of when things started. And we know that um, people uh, will start to display symptoms of a personality disorder sometimes when they're younger. We see that sort of foster over time. Also looking at risk factors, et cetera, and trying to figure out, you know, if this is a person that was perfectly fine before they started using substances, then maybe it's not, you know, uh, per se personality disorder. Maybe it is a condition of the, um, you know, of the substance um, abuse. However, in this case, when we look at his history, we see a very long history of, you know, in interpersonal conflict. This was a person that, you know, was either at the top of his game or he was extremely low. Um, again, as Dr. Schwartz said, the faucet was either fully on or it was completely off. And that was the same in this case. So if we, if we look and we follow the symptoms over time, this was a gentleman that definitely met the criteria for borderline personality disorder. So what are the risk factors that we've identified? Now, when you think about this case, um, we know that this is a person with some impulsivity, um, was definitely very, um, uh, very easily persuaded um, according to the status of his relationship. Um, had made some suicidal threats, and now, of course, he's going to be carrying a gun. So we have to think about that, you know, anytime that we're dealing with individuals, um, we need to be exploring whether or not they are using any substances. And I don't think that this gentleman would have ever considered himself to have an addiction. However, he was drinking on a daily basis and was using escalating doses of uh, various uh, prescription medications. And so what interventions would we recommend? Well, number one, obviously, we know that controlled substances are a significant factor when we are essentially prescribing them, um, trying to do uh, no harm to individuals, but sometimes uh, in the context of this, we can create you know, evidence of addiction. So for any of you who are prescribers or any of you who are dealing um, with individuals that have a history of addiction, the key piece is to start looking for any signs of misuse of medication, whether it's early refills, whether it's, it's calling in, uh, reporting that the medications have been stolen, uh, people have, you know, taken his prescriptions, all these symptoms were um, starting. Now we, in most states, have the prescription drug monitoring program, which would help this individual was often going to the uh, hospitals to acquire interim doses. And he was a you know, very charming fellow and um, an extremely convincing, very intelligent guy. Um, and so typically, he was able to acquire them. So definitely looking at some other options, especially as first-line tr treatment, would definitely be advisable. And so... Also, when we have an individual that has a history of self-injurious behaviors or suicidal threats or attempts, we have to think about whether or not it's, it's a good thing for them to have access to a weapon. The problem is, is that, of course, we know with impulsivity, when you have access to a weapon, um, if you are a person that reacts very quickly, it would be um, fairly easy then um, to, to do something that could have long-term consequences. Um, and so what risk reduction or treatment strategies should be considered? And in a case like this, this individual really should have, first of all, not had access to, um, to a weapon, given his history of, of self-harm. Also, because of the fact that, uh, you know, his, his impulsivity was, was very problematic. Um, to get him perhaps into a detox program or to do a further analysis of you know, whether or not he was misappropriating his medications or taking far more than he should have. Now, to give you all the uh, resolution of this case, it's a very unfortunate one, and that is he used the gun that he had a psychiatric clearance to, to carry, um, unfortunately, to kill himself. Mm -hmm. And his girlfriend um, had... Um, confronted him in regards to his abuse of benzodiazepines and, and alcohol, as well as getting involved with um, some opiate pain medications. Um, and this evolved into a very uh, intense argument 
And unfortunately, he, in, in her presence, um, did take the gun and, and point it right to his head. And of course, it was extremely dramatic. We think about individuals that have borderline personality disorder and that how these, you know, can be very dramatic, um, you know, um, you know, especially when angered. And in this case, it was really profound um, in many ways and really shaped my, my career because I realized the importance of, of identifying individuals that have um, not only personality disorders, but also to look at uh, whether or not they, this could lead to substance use. And also, of course, realizing that um, they may not be forthcoming with the fact that it has evolved into an addiction they may not even perceive that to be the case. So, so I hope that um, this sort of solidifies everything that was talked about today as far as the importance of, you know, looking to see if there is an underlying um, psychiatric condition um, and, of course, trying to collaborate and, and work to treat both um, the addiction as well as that underlying condition. So. Dr. Garcia, I have a couple points about that. Um, that was a fascinating and tragic uh, case study uh, that my guess is when the girlfriend uh, confronted him about these issues, she was probably also threatening to leave him, and that was fanning the fear of abandonment. The other Absolutely. Thing, and the other thing is uh, very commonly uh, they've done studies on this. Men and women exhibit pretty much the same behaviors. Men will get the diagnosis of antisocial uh, personality disorder, and women get the diagnosis of borderline personality disorder. So they think in many cases men are misdiagnosed. And this was this highlight an example of someone who certainly, while had some antisocial personality features, was definitely, you know, seemed to be much more consistent with a borderline personality disorder diagnosis. So thank you. And thank you all. Well, I want to thank you both for uh, an excellent presentation. Um, really appreciate it. And we do have a few questions, um, so I will read them. Um, let me just say a few of the questions center on will the slides be available to them? And yes, we always make the slides available to everyone, so that will be coming. You also need to know that this webinar was recorded and it will also be available for anyone to observe you know, and listen to at the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry website, as well as the International Nurses Society on Addictions website as well. It gets posted in both places. So um, here's the first question. Um, as a medical practitioner, I've heard so many scientific truths about uh, THC. How can we neglect federal law and allow a gateway drug such as THC to influence many of our patients' personalities? And that's a great question, and um, I'll turn it over to our presenters. But of course, one of the pieces of legislation that did get turned down in New Jersey, but of course, we were uh, going for one of those states that would uh, have recreational use of THC. So it is a great question posed. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Schwartz or Dr. Um, Garcia, any comments about that, your feelings about that? Um, Dr. Schwartz, I don't know if you want me to, I could just throw my, my two cents in. Mm -hmm. I think that um, it has been my experience in the state of Pennsylvania where I live, uh, medical marijuana is um, approved for um, very specific conditions. It is not available in leaf form. Um, it is just uh, like liquids and edibles. Um, what's interesting is that um, many of my patients um, that have either anxiety disorders um, personality disorders, et cetera. Um, anyone, of course, as you think about in PA, it's post-traumatic stress disorder. So people that have a history of abuse, we know that that puts them at particular risk um, for personality disorder and substance use. Um, they have gone forward with um, getting medical marijuana with the intention that um, perhaps it would help them to get off of their psychotropic medicine. And I really have not seen the results that I was expecting. Um, I'm shocked, but I've not, I don't know if it's just the products that are available. It seems like it's extremely expensive in Pennsylvania. Um, and it doesn't seem like it is, has given them the, um, the kind of medical and, and mental benefits that they were hoping for. 
Um, the other thing is that the majority of the marijuana or, you know, that's been in the community <laughs> on the streets, um, it doesn't seem like it's purity is, is mm -hmm. of course, similar to what you would be able to get if, if it is, you know, from a dispensary. Um, and so some of them have actually become somewhat ill afterwards um, because I guess it is such a pure product. And so I really don't know. I think that, you know, it's like anything else. I would, I would say that I think the individual experience, it just depends. And I clinically have, and have really not, um, had as many positive experiences from patients as I thought. A significant number of my patients that are using uh, medical marijuana, I almost feel, or using uh, non-medical marijuana, but just using it for anxiety control, that they, it, it, they almost seem to be trying to convince themselves that it's not a problem for them. So I, I don't want to be judge or jury with them. Um, so I always provide them with information, um, so, you know, the changes that, and they believe the changes are long term and that cannot be undone. So I share with them the concerns and the risk and that, and I support them in making their own decision. I try to avoid getting in that power struggle with them um, because I don't think it's going to be of help in therapeutic relationship. Okay. Thank you. Then we have another question. It appears obvious that these symptoms can either be a personality disorder or the symptoms of the addiction itself. What are the assessment techniques used to distinguish the appropriate diagnosis? Almost everyone I know that is suffering from addiction, both because of the addiction's impact on the brain and the developed lifestyle necessary to support the addiction, display personality disorder symptoms, but these often subside or disappear with a well-founded recovery and treatment plan. Right. I always look at the history. I try to establish that there were features of a personality disorder or there were not features of a personality disorder before the drug use began. I remember having a student come into my office and he had a long history, a fairly substantial history with the state, with the state in terms of criminal activity. And he shared with me that he had gotten sober and I could look at his criminal record and I could almost tell you the date he got sober because there was a com complete ab a abrupt and cessation of criminal problems. And he was just enthused about being sober. He had the uh, AA, um, keychain and you know he's in the softball team and his identity was being a, a, a person in recovery and it was just a boy it was completely buoying to him shortly thereafter i had another a student come in and the student also had a criminal history and he was concerned about getting uh, being able to sit and, and come into the program and sit for state boards and um you know he was immediately shared with me that he had an attorney he really wanted to become a nurse I asked him when his, because I have found in my career that people who are in sobriety um, identify, can very often identify the date that they came, so became sober. And he could not share that with me. And he was getting more and more like agitated with me that I was talking about this. And then he mentioned he had a lawyer because it was so important to him. And it felt very different. So I think a big piece of establishing whether there's a personality disorder, which I suspect my second patient had, my second student had, uh, versus uh, it's the addiction coming into play. Once the addiction is managed um, or they're in sobriety, those features that are consistent with the personality disorder just ev uh, evaporate. Okay. Uh, another question. What do you think about medication-assisted treatment with these patients? Uh, I, I could answer. I mean, I could throw in, I guess, my mm -hmm. opinion. I I am a prescriber of, of buprenorphine and have seen it um, assist many individuals as far as being able to um, to get off of drugs. I mean, I think that it's like anything else. When we're dealing with individuals with personality disorders, um, chaos can be extremely problematic and um, most of the programs of, that are in the area where I live are extremely rigid as far as attendance is concerned. Um, what I have found is that individuals that are a little erratic and chaotic in their lifestyle often do not fare well with adhering to the um, restrictions and the requirements 
Um, and so eventually, uh, they end up um, being taken off of the treatment um, or discharged from the program. So that has just been my own experience. Right. And my experience has been that I initially, uh, when I began working with the, uh, with um, medication assistant treatment, uh, would, was that I expected it almost to be really get wonderful gains and see a remarkable difference. And I don't feel that way anymore. I think it's an additional strategy, another layer of support, but it's definitely not a magical wand. Okay. Next is just a comment. This was an excellent presentation. Clarity and simplicity of slides was appreciated. Oh, good. Thank you. Nice okay. to hear. Okay. Another question. Due to a person's personality disorder behaviors, many of these patients often develop acute medical issues. An example would be like osteomyelitis, which require admission to a medical floor, not psych, and nursing is often overwhelmed. Are there any main points which can help with care? And I mean, I can answer from an acute care perspective, my first thought, and then I'll let our presenters answer that. Um, you know, I, I think every, even acute care hospital really should have like a psychiatric nurse practitioner or a physician liaison where, you know, they could be consulted to also help with care from the psychiatric standpoint. Um, because every patient has a psyche that they bring when they go into any healthcare situation. That's just my perspective. I'll open it up to our presenters. They're the experts. I think education and awareness is the key piece. It was always very difficult for us to, um, to manage what, what we are not comfortable with. And in some cases, working with patients that have personality disorder, um, people often find it very unfulfilling in healthcare. Um, so it's almost like moving forward with resistance. I think if we can understand the individual better, that's you know a, a very uh, pervasive part of of their personality that you know infiltrates every facet of their life. Um, and I have found that even working with uh, my own patients that have borderline personality, once their family doctors, for an example, understand more about their disease process it does seem that things just run smoother. Um, so I think education is, a, is, a, is very helpful. Okay. I, I think another uh, component of that care in the medical arena would be consistency and uh, the staff all being kept abreast of the care that's being delivered to the patient and the limit setting that is done. I've seen some really challenging situations where the staff were almost refusing to take care of the patient because of the chaos. So I think it's really important for the, the clinical manager, whoever is in a position uh, uh, overseeing the management of the unit to be really supportive of staff and uh, make sure that everyone is aware of the care and the consequences and just that it's consistent management. Okay. To prevent that splitting, that can be very difficult for staff to deal with. And sometimes I think some staff needs to be pulled away from the situation if they're getting to the point that they are really getting burdened by it and they're not not—they're becoming untherapeutic in their interactions with the patient, which we want to avoid at all costs. But it's certainly understandable. It can be a difficult situation, I think. Yeah. With the THC question, what about patients using CBD oil? Does that seem to affect those with the personality disorders? I haven't had much experience with that. Have you, Dr. Garcia? I've had a, a few patients that have used CBD oil, but I've, I've also talked to many people in the community now that seem to be um, using CBD. I think that um, th this is just my own um, perception. Uh, it seems that it has a common influence um, for, for people and some of that perhaps may be placebo. I don't know. I've never used it myself, um, but people do seem to be using it as, you know, for stress management and whatnot. And I think um, that at this point, it doesn't look like there's any particular uh, consequences from its use. So I don't really see it as problematic. And if that was um, it's almost like we, you know, we, we choose the vice, you know, the lesser of, of evils. It would probably be um, a better option, hopefully, than like using drugs. So if it helped in that framework um, to prevent them from, you know, from turning to substances, 
um, I don't think it would be an issue. That's interesting, Dr. Garcia, because I've had a couple patients on it, but in both situations, I did not find, uh, it didn't make me as uncomfortable as in uh, patients that were using cannabis every day and, for, and reporting for, you know, for numerous uh, health benefits. Um, but it didn't get, I did it, it didn't seem to be, uh, uh, they were pursuing it or um, focused on it or desiring to, they needed to have it every day. I didn't have that experience. Now it could have just been those two patients. I don't know, but sort of ironic. Okay. They're even selling it now at the mall, so. <laughs> yeah. Um. I work in acute detox. We often have patients on our unit with borderline personality disorders and substance use disorders. I appreciate the recommendations for long-term treatment, but I'm wondering if you can offer any tips or strategies for de-escalating a patient with borderline personality disorder in the moment. I, my approach has always been I, I try to remove them from the stimulating situation so that they're not getting overstimulated and that they can maintain uh, ego integrity. Then I ask that, you know, make, uh, I always make a, an observation, you seem very upset, you seem very troubled. And then I let them talk and sometimes they just need to uh, just discuss, you know, get it. It's almost a cathartic a catharsis, their uh, interaction with me at that point. I give them support. And then what can, what can we do now to maintain your support, your, your ability to maintain control? How can I support you? And I find those strategies can be very helpful. I mean, you may need to get medication on board, um, but I don't like to make that association between I'm getting more comfortable and my anxiety decreases after I took a pill. So I try to avoid that. Some situations I think it's, you have to do that um, to maintain safety on the unit for the patient as well as others. But I think if you connect with them and you demonstrate that what I call that firm loving parent that I'm here, it's safe. I will maintain your safety. If you aren't unable to do so, I will and I'm here for you and making sure that you pull them away from this situation that's stimulating. Usually it might be another patient or another situation going on that's triggering them. Okay. Can you guide related to care for young adults with substance misuse? I have found providers are very quick to send to drug and alcohol treatment, Suboxone, et cetera, but no one looks into seeing if there is an underlying personality disorder, which may be driving the train. And I would say that that is something that, you know, it's, it's a mindset. It's almost like, you know, we, if we don't identify the underlying cause, it's, you know, we don't want to just apply the Band-Aid. So that's why I think that, you know, counseling is very important when you're offering medication-assisted treatment and um, offering, you know, some additional services. You know, it reminds me of the work that has been done with um, gastric bypass surgery. Oftentimes, you know, the programs require individuals to um, undergo some sort of, you know, counseling and, and um, a psychiatric assessment just to sort of add some insight as to why the behavior or the symptom may have, um, may have occurred in the first place. And I think that with addiction, it's really important. And I always look at that as, you know, very ethical practice. Um, to offer counseling, because even if the person doesn't perceive that they need it, um, I think that, you know, there is, you know, there's some underlying reason um, that, you know, led to that point. Great. Regarding patients who have OUD and psychiatric comorbidities, personality disorders, and receiving medications, do they generally do better on buprenorphine or methadone, assuming that they are not yet ready for naltrexone? And I'm really not, I haven't had as much direct experience with that because I have never really worked in a, in a methadone um, prescribing practice. But what I would say is that in some cases, you know, methadone, there's a lot of engagement. So I think depending on the level of chaos that, you know, perhaps uh, structure of uh, coming to the location um, most days may be helpful. Um, it may keep them, you know, engaged and grounded. I don't know, so it would be it would be interesting, but I'm not sure I have enough experience in that area to to clearly state. 
Okay. And then regarding medical marijuana as treatment, have you noticed patients struggling with an increase in symptoms of paranoia? Yes, I have, absolutely. Okay, great. And another question was, is it possible to get the copy of the slides? And yes, we will send everyone the slides. Can you recommend programs for MPs who may be interested in learning more certification with addiction and psych? Um, I can comment here, I think. One, one of the things um, I, I always encourage people who work in that field uh, as nurses to, to really become part of the International Nurses Society on Addictions. Um, we have an annual conference every year that rotates around the country. It's in Baltimore this year, the second week in October. Um, they're also to get certified in the field of addictions that we have what's called the CARN, Certified Addictions Registered Nurse for RNs, and then the CARN AP has advanced practice. Um, Drexel, we do a one-day review course twice a year. We're also doing it down as a pre-conference in October um, at the conference. So that's one way um, to also get involved and, and to find some resources. Also, go to the websites. Um, you know, again, all, all the presentations we've done over the past several years uh, related to the opioid epidemic are posted there, as well as the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry as well. Um, can the antisocial personality disorder become more manipulative with certain talk therapies? I think uh, manipulation is a key feature that is very often not going to change. <laughs> um, contingency management um, it has been helpful in that the patient gets rewards for doing uh, what's appropriate, you know, considered appropriate behavior by society's standards. I don't know. I think I don't know necessarily. That I think they get more manipulative. Uh, it might be that the clinician is uh, having more contact and seeing them, uh, seeing a pattern of their behavior, um, you know, over time. Great. Okay. And then two comments and one last question. So the two comments are, hello, Dr. Schwartz and Dr. Garcia. Greetings from your former student. Excellent <laughs> presentation. <laughs> Hi, Vera. Yeah. Oh, nice. Thank you. you. And then, um, Another comment, such a great webinar. Um, and then the last question is, um, how does naltrexone help with decreasing self-injurious behaviors? Uh, I believe it's the manipulation of the dopamine. That the dopamine yeah. is raised and then that prevents the self-harm. Okay. Well, again, thank you for a uh, wonderful presentation. If we could go um, back to just, um, I think there's a couple slides I have to comment on and a couple reminders and then we'll end the webinar. So do we have any more slides or no, are we done? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Runder. I, mean, it, I think I was, did I say increases the dopamine? It decreases the dopamine and therefore the self injurious behavior, which can cause the uh, increase in dopamine, is, does not occur. I, I'm sorry if I clarified myself. <laughs> I'm not sure if I said increase or decrease, but it blocks okay. the dopamine from rising and similar as it is with opioids um, and, uh, or alcohol use. And then because the dopamine has decreased that, uh, that very often patients experience a high a buzz from self-harming. So it's not there anymore. Okay. Yeah, I think there are a couple more slides I have to comment on. That ends the questions. Um, can you advance the slides forward or are we at the very end? I think there's a couple more slides. Uh, back the end, there we go. I just have to talk about the uh, Provider Clinical Support Mentoring Program. This is designed to offer general information to uh, clinicians about evidence-based clinical practices and prescribing medications for opioid addiction. Um, PCSS mentors are a national network of providers with expertise in addictions, pain, evidence-based treatment, including medication-assisted treatment. We use a three-tiered approach that allows every mentor-mentee relationship to be unique and cater to the specific needs of the mentee. And again, there's no cost. It's covered by the grant. So for more information, you can visit uh, the website that is listed. And then I guess the next slide. And we did the questions. And so just a reminder, we thank you all for being here. 
Uh, please be uh, certain to uh, answer the uh, evaluation and send it in so you get your contact hours. Uh, these are the uh, current members of the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry on the grant. And actually in the next cycle, which starts in August, there are actually even more uh, organizations joining in this grant effort. Again, our goal, of course, is combating this opioid epidemic. Thank you for being here. We will now end the webinar. Have a great day. And thank you, Dr. Schwartz and Dr. Garcia for the excellent presentation. Thank you, everyone. Yeah.